Good afternoon. Thanks for joining me towards the tail end of your day, especially on Halloween, so I appreciate that. Um, my talk's going to cover how to better and more effectively encrypt data uh, when using a cloud service provider. So before we get into the talk, I want to give you just a little bit of information about my background. Um, I've been in the information security space for about 20 years. Um, if you guys recognize the logo in the bottom left-hand corner, if you're from this area, that is, in fact, Errol's video. So my first tech job was when Errol's made a pivot out of the VHS business, VHS rental business, into the internet service provider space. Uh, we used to work out of the side of a warehouse um, right near this area, about 20 minutes away. So that's sort of how I got into tech. And then from there on, I moved sort of straight into security. Um, I joined what was uh, a security titan at the time, Symantec, doing mostly security operations work. So that's most of my early days. And then I had the opportunity to join a very young consulting firm called Mandiant, which at the time specialized in forensics and incident response. And then later in my career, um, I joined a couple of friends, and we founded a company called Ubix Security. Um, and most of my time nowadays is focused on application security and cryptography. Um, I tend to believe that you can say uh, many things with the use of a meme. So you can see lots of memes inside of my presentation. And uh, I really, really love eating pizza. Every time I go to any new place, I always try to seek out uh, the local pizza restaurant. I'm also a big Formula One fan. I don't have a particular team. I just enjoy watching Formula One in general. And then lastly, um, my work has always afforded me the opportunity to travel to all kinds of different places, many different countries across the globe. So it's something that I also enjoy. So um, I'm going to just quickly run through the things we're going to talk about and some of the things I'm not going to talk about. Uh, first area is probably something you're very familiar with, which is cloud provider shared responsibility model. I'll touch on sort of what I call the data security theater that most cloud providers um, share and enable us to, to protect our data. And then I'll talk about the realities of what you actually get when you use cloud encryption through a vendor. Then I'll talk about the concept of bring your own encryption, which is really the crux of this conversation. And then finally, I'm going to cover a case study uh, from the team at Cash App, which has done something very interesting um, that I think you guys will find super insightful. In terms of the things that I won't cover, um, I'm not going to get into specifics about each major cloud provider and sort of the, the features that they offer. We won't cover in-transit encryption. That's a mostly solved problem. Uh, and I won't get into detailed cryptography concepts, but I'm happy to have a conversation with anyone uh, after, the, after the chat. So before I get into it, you're going to hear me talk about security theater. So here's a quick definition that I pulled from Wikipedia. Um, lots of sort of security celebrities in the space talk about security theater. It's essentially the practice of taking security measures that are considered to help you feel like you're doing security, but don't actually provide any meaningful benefit. Um, and I think that applies itself pretty aggressively in sort of data protection, especially data at rest encryption. You guys have probably seen some version of this somewhere. If, you're, if you use Amazon Web Services or Azure or Google Cloud, this basically says that the cloud provider is responsible, responsible for physical security, and you're responsible for everything else. Um, and I'm going to pick on AWS throughout my talk, not because I, don't, I dislike them or I don't think they're better than the others, but that's the one that I'm most familiar with. So before I get into sort of the threat protection measures, I do want to talk about the importance of threat modeling. Um, as you guys are probably well aware, since you're here at OWASP convention, uh, threat modeling is a structured approach of identifying and prioritizing potential threats to a system. This is an important step before you ultimately decide what are the types of data and what are the different controls that you want to put in place, because you want to understand that system, you want to understand any vulnerabilities it might have based on design or certain software uh, coding or design decisions, and then also the type of threats that might be impacting your, your infrastructure. And when you think about building a data model, um, you want to document how data flows through a system, uh, what are the potential threats to that system, and then finally the controls. So this is a critical first step before you get into figuring out what data protection really means and what the right approach might be for, for your organization and your application. Um, so for the purposes of this talk, um, I'm going to focus mostly on protective measures against, one, insider threats. So think of your database admin. And of course, there are no bad database admins out there. But if there were to exist someday a database admin with nefarious intentions, this would help protect against that. So that's the insider threat. The other is supply chain. 
What happens if your cloud service provider is compromised, their infrastructure, or if they have an insider threat? And don't think of cloud service providers as just AWS, Azure, Google, and the major players. Think of them as also smaller providers, maybe regional providers that could be here in the US or in, in different parts of the world. And then lastly, target attacks. Um, some people refer to them as APTs, but people who have a very specific objective that they're trying to carry out, uh, who generally engage in espionage, whether it be financially motivated or could be nation state backed, um, and sort of how they go about it. Now, I've got a bunch of links here at the bottom. OWASP has tons and tons of threat modeling resources, um, so definitely check those out if you're familiar with them. Um, what I want to spend a few minutes now talking through is really the data security theater tools um, that the cloud providers uh, offer. And I'm going to pick on, again, I'm going to pick on AWS because that's the one I'm most familiar with. So the first one that you probably are very familiar with is something called transparent data encryption, available for most database technologies out there. Uh, what you really get is disk encryption. And what it's actually doing is it's encrypting the entire database. Now, some database vendors offer things like field or column level encryption. But the challenge with those approaches is even at scale, sometimes it's not reasonable to implement them because the performance impact is so severe that you can't actually use it. And this is something that I've come across in tons and tons of investigations. The second is what's referred to as SSE, or server-side encryption. Um, and what you get here is disk encryption. So what it's doing is encrypting files in storage. And what this protects against is someone walking into a data center or a cloud provider's data center and yanking a disk out of a rack, which typically doesn't happen because they're very well protected physically. Lastly, our key management services. And what key management services enable are more robust key storage as well as key lifecycle tasks. So if you're familiar with PCI DSS, there's all kinds of requirements around what are called key rotation, could be master key rotation, data key rotation. So generally, there's a compliance regime that's driving key management best practices, and KMS and underlying hardware security modules, which are called HSMs, help drive that. Um, but what they really do is manage encryption keys in lifecycle, and they enable disk encryption. Um, and the cool thing is with most cloud providers is you can leverage KMS with things like TDE and SSE so that you have key lifecycle tied into those. So I'm going to do two quick rants throughout my conversation. This is going to be the first one. Um, and really what I'm going to rant about is one of the worst kept secrets in security is that most storage encryption doesn't provide any meaningful security benefit of running systems. And when I say storage encryption, what I'm specifically referring to are database encryption, file and disk encryption, and the server-side encryption that I showed you on the previous slide. The core issue with these solutions is that they're designed for physical theft use cases, like literally someone yanks a server, or you take a, a disk out of a system and you move it for physical storage somewhere, the protection of that data. They're not designed for running systems where data is being handled and processed on an ongoing basis. And this is because they were designed to be, to be transparent. That's why TDE is referred to as transparent data encryption. Now, the problem with completely transparent encryption is it's also transparent to your DBA. So if I'm your database admin, the encryption is entirely transparent to me. If I want to run a SQL query, I get to see the real data. And that's a big problem. Now, there's two other underlying issues. One is that it's trivial to bypass with privileged admin credentials. I just gave you the DBA example. If I'm a DBA with admin credentials, I can get to the data. Now, let's say my network was compromised and the nefarious actor got a hold of my d database admin credentials, same thing happens. They can get all the data. Now, I'm going to pick on Oracle for a second because I don't know many people who actually like Oracle. Uh, if there are Oracle fans in here, I apologize in advance. Oracle has an encryption license that you can buy. And what it does is it allows you to encrypt fields and columns within an Oracle database. They also sell you another license, should you choose to pay them more, called Oracle Vault. And what Oracle Vault is designed to do is to ensure that the DBA can't access the data in the clear. Pretty awesome, right? Well, if I have server admin credentials, I can disable Oracle Vault, which then gets me to the DBA layer, which I can, I can actually see the data. So just one example, there was a talk a few years ago, I think, at DEF CON, where someone got into the details of how you can execute this. If you do a quick Google search, if you're interested in the concept and how they did it, um, it's all documented. The second thing I'll touch on is, in most large enterprises, sure, an application may write data to an Oracle database, for an example. 
but the likelihood of it staying in that Oracle database forever and ever and ever is very low. It'll likely end up in a data analytics platform like Snowflake. So what happens in that scenario? I've encrypted the data in Oracle using their encryption. Now to get it into Snowflake in a usable manner, what do I need to do? I need to decrypt the data, then move it and put in Snowflake and hope that the team either pay for the Snowflake encryption license or they actually have it enabled, which isn't always the case, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So that's my rant. I'm done there. Let's assume that you have a web application that you're running in AWS. Um, and it's doing one of two things. Let's say it's an insurance company app, and you've got a, uh, a web app and a mobile app for consumers. If they get in a car accident or they have an insurance claim, they're going to upload a picture, maybe evidence of a, of a specific accident. Uh, and then they're going to put up a whole bunch of sensitive data, like their name, date of birth, social security number, all kinds of other stuff. And that gets written to an S3 bucket. And also, let's pick on RDS, which is a database uh, solution in AWS. Um, most people will have the wherewithal to enable encryption. But let's say they don't. You're going to create a problem for yourself, because now you have an RDS instance with sensitive data in it where there's no encryption. And you might have something like a social security card or an ID that's sitting inside of an S3 bucket that's also unencrypted. Most people don't do this, right? Now, if we were to say, OK, well, let's say I do, uh, and I want to explore the options that are available to me in Amazon, what's available? So coming back to the TDE example, you can absolutely enable transparent data encryption. Um, what that will do is ensure that the underlying storage for the DB instance is encrypted. Uh, all the automated backups, the read replicas, the snapshots. Essentially, it's the easy button, but it's got a lot of hidden pains that I'll cover later in my talk. The second obvious option is server-side encryption. Um, now, there are a bunch of different configuration modes for what the acronym SSE is. Uh, and I'll talk you through three of the major ones. Um, the most commonly used configuration pattern is referred to SSE S3 which is essentially leveraging AS-256 encryption. It's quite often the one that most development teams employ simply because it's the easiest to configure and encrypts the data, and it checks the box on most checklists. Uh, so I'm going to walk you through how that sort of works at a high level. So whenever SSE encryption is enabled, AWS uses an account and region-specific S3 server master key to generate a data key. So what AWS is doing is they're saying, in this region, we're going to use this master key and that master key is going to be used to generate what are called data encryption keys. It's the data encryption keys that actually encrypt your data. The data key is then protected by encrypting it with the master key that was used to actually derive it. And then you store the data and the data encryption key alongside it. And now S3 will manage the data key handling and storage all behind the scenes, which makes it completely transparent and seamless for you. Sounds like a great option. And in most cases, it's also the easiest option. In SSS3 mode, uh, the account's master key uh, is used to generate that key. So whenever a user is retrieving an object, let's say there's a file in there, and the example that I gave, uh, maybe it's a license ID picture, it's decrypted on the fly and then provided in the clear. In essence, anyone with access to the data is able to retrieve the object in the clear. Now, this might sound OK, right? But let's think of a scenario where a database admin has access to a DB table or the table includes sensitive data such as a social security number or a credit card number. Usually these columns values are encrypted by the application before persisting to the database. Uh, in this case, even if a database admin has the credentials, they can. But in the SSE and TD examples, that's not the case. If I have the DBA admin credentials, if I'm a database admin, or I have access to the S3 bucket, all the protections are transparent, and it's going to serve me all the data. So the next configuration step I want to talk to is what's referred to as SSE plus KMS. Um, so remember, AWS, in the previous example, generates data keys um, that were created using an account and region-specific master key. In this mode, instead of using that default region-specific master key, the KMS will specify and create something more purposefully that's referred to as a CMK, which is a customer-managed Oh, sorry, a customer master key. Now, that makes a difference from an encryption perspective. So that's one of the big differences between SSE and SSE with KMS. Now, when we use a customer master key in KMS, AWS permits us to attach a resource policy to that key. So you have your underlying S3 policies, and now you also have a KMS policy. And that's really important. 
because what you can do is you can say, even though Jim, as an example, has access to this S3 bucket through this policy, I can make it so that for the KMS policy, he does not have access. So even if he hits that S3 bucket, he's not gonna see any of the data. That's super, super important. So that resource policy is what allows us to define who has access to it. To draw an analogy, um, applications use a key to encrypt sensitive data or secrets. The keys used for encryption is stored in a key store and it's protected with a password. Um, and generally only the application that can access that password can get access to the data. And that's really how KMS works. Now one of the things I do want to mention, because none of you have ever run into this, right, is it's critical to note that a poorly defined resource policy on the KMS side, or simply using the default policy on KMS, will grant permissions to the user. So what a lot of people, they fall into this trap is that they're like, I'm gonna do SSE plus KMS. So they have their S3 bucket, they have the policy well defined there, and then when they enable the KMS component to get this customer managed key or customer master key, they just choose the default policy. Guess what the default policy does? It allows the user to get access to the data. So super important to make sure that that's something that's very well paid attention to so that the resource policy is defined specific to the access controls you want to do. Now, later in my talk, I'm going to talk about sort of policy sprawl and the complexities of that, um, but we'll touch on that later. The last option I want to talk about is what is referred to as SSEC. In this mode, the client, you and I, are responsible for the management of the data key used for encryption decryption. And we actually end up passing that to AWS so AWS does not store the data encryption key. So just to give you a quick example, I've got a file in S3 that I encrypt. In the other examples, of the first two with SSE and SSE KMS, the data encryption key resides with the data in AWS infrastructure. In the SSEC example, you retain the data key, you pass it to AWS when it's needed. Um, so just to give you more detail there, the data key is not stored in AWS, uh, rather you provide it along each time there's a request for an encryption or decryption operation. Um, so to give you an analogy, this is like archival tapes stored in an offsite facility. Imagine that the tapes are stored encrypted, and when needed, they're brought back on a prem. So sort of similar concept there. So those are the three major flavors of SSE. There's different ways to build on this and get fancier. Um, I'm gonna share one of the major concepts that, that, that we've had experience with uh, in a few minutes. So, now, some may argue that the KMS access policy can't prevent access, um, but coming back to my previous example, you wanna make sure that there's good separation there. So let me walk you through why you can't really rely on AWS KMS. One, let's imagine, let's imagine this insurance app scenario that I shared a few minutes ago. Um, you wanna do the right thing, you're gonna enable SSE KMS. First thing you're gonna do is you're gonna enable transparent data encryption on your, on your RDS instance. So now you've got encrypted an encrypted database and then you're gonna enable SSE or server-side encryption on the actual S3 bucket. Now all the files that land there are protected and encrypted. Then you're gonna tie in the KMS piece. Now what KMS is gonna do is, again, it's gonna store a master key, it's gonna derive one, and it's gonna use that to create all the data encryption keys. Now once the encryption keys are used to encrypt the data, it's stored alongside the data. Now here's a problem with this approach. If I get your AWS credentials, if I get your S3 credentials, or if I get your RDS credentials, or if I get your account level credentials, I can still see the data. Now you can try to solve this problem with resource policies, but there's some level of elevated access that will ultimately grant you access to that data. And we've seen this scenario, in my personal experience, play out tons and tons of time, uh, where people believe, hey, I'm protected, but in reality, the actual security benefit is more so on the compliance side, to be able to tell someone who shows up once a year and says, do you have encryption enabled? Yes, I do. Is it effective? That's a different question. That they generally don't ask. So, failed again. So, another quick rant, this is my last rant. Um, painful gotchas. Again, I'm gonna pick on AWS, because that's the one I know the most about. First, encryption is not supported on all database types. Let's say you run a whole bunch of really small databases because you don't want to pay Amazon tens of thousands of dollars a month. Well, maybe encryption's not available for those. Second is it's super straightforward. If you're just gonna spin up an RDS instance right now, super easy to enable encryption. Like literally a checkbox, easy button, you're done. But 
let's say that RDS instance is already running and it's been running for some time. Let me walk you through the pain of getting encryption enabled. First, halt the database. Then take a snapshot. Then launch a fresh database instance using the snapshot. Then modify DNS settings to reference the new database and perform any other relevant application configuration changes. Then erase the previous database. By the way, all the backups from the original database, gone. Next thing I want to touch on is, let's say you want to back up to another account because, I don't know, the team got bigger for some reason, and this has never happened either, right? Multiple teams have multiple AWS accounts. Well, if you utilize the default encryption key for a database, which most people do because that's the easy button, transferring backups to a different AWS account becomes impossible. You can't do it. It just literally is not possible. The reason? Sharing the standard encryption key across distinct AWS accounts is not feasible in AWS, and it's no different in any other major, the other major providers. And by the way, let's say you're like, well, I'm good because I actually took a backup of the database. Nope, doesn't work either. Um, the last one is deleting the key uh, and your data's gone. Now, this should be pretty obvious, right? If you delete the master key, uh, your data disappears. But the real challenge is that you can't make backups of the keys. Although KMS does a, doesn't alert you when you're about to remove a currently active key, yeah, you heard that right. If you delete an active key that's being used to encrypt data or has encrypted data, it won't alert you. But they do allow you to reverse that deletion. Well, I think it's like a period of 70 or seven to 30 days or something, so you have a little bit of protection there. And the last one I'll touch on is complexities and access control. Um, correct IAM configuration is just one part of the puzzle. Ensuring appropriate key access is another, um, because as I mentioned earlier, KMS has its own distinct permission framework uh, outside of the standard ABS permissions. So along with IAM, you've got another layer to navigate, which makes permission-related troubleshooting even more interesting. So what are we gonna do? Like, I'm standing up here telling you that like, all the native encryption controls, even with KMS, is not very effective, so what are we actually gonna do? Well, really, what I wanted to talk to you about today is not all the pains and all the problems, but the concept of bring your own encryption and how that can actually help you effectively protect your data. So client-side data level encryption um, enables you to encrypt data at the application or access layers before it ever gets to storage. Now, you might be running sort of a hybrid application architecture where you're running an application on-premise and you're storing data in the cloud, or you might have an application architecture where everything is hosted in the cloud. This applies in both those scenarios. Um, but the idea is let's embed the actual encryption and decryption capabilities directly in the application or an access layer. Um, when, I re when I refer to an access layer, what I'm talking about is something like an API gateway or a data analytics layer. Um, I won't cover that in this talk, but I'm happy to, to chat with folks afterwards on, on how that could look. But I'm going to give you some application-specific integration examples. There's a few important benefits, six specifically, that I'll touch on. One is that the data is encrypted at the point of creation or access. What we're not doing anymore is we're not relying on the encryption to occur once it gets to storage. We're encrypting the data at the point of access or creation. So. In the web application example I gave earlier, let's say I input my name into a form along with my social security number. As soon as I hit that submit button, that application is encrypting that data itself natively. Second is, instead of doing something like what database encryption does is let's encrypt the entire database or let's encrypt the entire table, you can encrypt each individual data element. So my first name has its own encryption key, my last name has its own encryption key, my social security number has its own encryption key, and that ensures that each individual record is protected. Third thing is that once data gets into the storage layer, it is always encrypted. Now, typically, when I mention this, um, I'll get a question like, well, how do I run a like, SQL query against encrypted data? Technology is advanced enough where that um, you, can, you can actually run queries against encrypted data um, using well-known encryption techniques. I'm not talking anything about sort of like emerging approaches, but even today there are some standard ways to be able to run uh, searches against ciphertext, which I, I'm, again, happy to talk about after the talk if there's anyone interested. Next thing I want to touch on is that now the DB and cloud admins cannot view any data. So if they hit that database, they really see nothing but ciphertext. 
The other aspect I want to touch on is you retain full control over your encryption and the keys. So what gets encrypted, how it gets encrypted, what algorithm is used, all fully in your control. When you use AWS, you basically get defaulted to AES-256, probably GCM. But in the case where you're implementing this on your, on your own, you have that flexibility. And the last thing I want to touch on before I progress past this slide is the cloud provider cannot view your data. So in the event that there's a supply chain risk or there's been a hack with a provider, which never happens, right? Um, then at least your data is protected and you have assurance that I have control over the keys, the cloud provider can't see the data, so a compromise in the infrastructure won't lead to sensitive data exposure on my part. There are two primary building blocks. So when we talk about bringing your own encryption, we talk about implementing encryption at the application or access layers, there are two very important pieces. Lots of considerations, but two important building blocks that I don't want to touch on. First is you need something to perform the actual encryption and decryption wherever you decide to integrate in your app. And that is achievable by using client-side encryption SDKs or open source encryption libraries. And that's what's actually gonna do the encryption decryption. So going back to my insurance application example, let's say you've got a mobile app and you wanna integrate client-side encryption, you can in pull in a package, uh, an open source library that does and exposes cryptographic functions. And that's gonna, what's gonna enable you to be able to do client-side encryption all the way down the mobile app layer if you choose so. The second major component is, well, what are you gonna do with the keys? How are you gonna manage the keys? Um, because key management is a, can be a very complicated uh, area, which I won't get into detail on, but you need a key management service. Uh, and I strongly recommend anyone who's considering this approach, do not try to build your own KMS. Um, do not try to even manage your own HSMs, which are hardware security modules, which are just, it's just a fancy name for things that store cryptographic keys use a common key management service like AWS KMS or Key Vault from, from Azure. And that's what's gonna provide the key management layer. So to quickly summarize, there's two key components, the encryption SDKs and the key management layer. Now, what many people who are not familiar with encryption may not know is that most encryption failures are really key management failures. A developer may have picked the right encryption library that's well vetted, widely used, uh, maintained actively, and then they hard code a key somewhere. Well, that's not gonna help you. It doesn't matter how strong and effective your encryption library is. So key management is uh, a really, really big one. Even the key master, if you happen to know him or find him, is not gonna be able to help you with this. So I'm gonna come back to my previous example and I'm gonna show you what an integration architecture would look like if you were to implement an application layer encryption or client-side encryption approach. First, you want to embed the client-side encryption SDK into the app. Now, this can happen in the example of a web app. You could do it on the front end. Uh, you could do it at the access layer. Uh, there's a bunch of different places you can integrate it to. There's sort of a, an open debate on like how close to the actual input of the data and the security benefits, um, but I won't touch on that. But that's what's going to provide the encryption and decryption functions. And that's also what's going to embed the data key along with the data. And then the second part, as I mentioned on the previous slide, is the key management service. And what the KMS is doing in this scenario is it's authorizing encryption and decryption operations. And it also securely stores master keys. Um, if you're not familiar with master keys, um, they essentially are used to derive data encryption keys. And they're generally stored when you're using a KMS in something that I referred to earlier, is, which is an HSM, which is generally FIPS compliant, tamper proof. Um, in many cases, you cannot even export the keys. So super, super secure storage for keys. Now, in this example, now that I've got the encryption uh, library deployed or integrated into my application, and I've tied that into a KMS system, what I'm now going to be able to achieve is that file, that license ID, that social security card picture that I uploaded to S3 is now natively protected by the application, encrypted, then it lands in the S3 bucket. And all that sensitive data that I inputted and then ultimately landed and was written to a, a database table is also individually protected and encrypted. And in the event that the DBA or the S3 admin or the cloud admin or some nefarious actor gets a hold of privileged cloud credentials or admin credentials, they cannot access the data. 
Now, I'm going to talk through in a few minutes the, the various layers that an adversary would need to get to, but this makes it substantially more difficult for someone to carry out a data theft exercise. So that's sort of the high-level integration architecture. Now, back to the threat model. Um, I want to touch on this because we talked earlier about how do you protect your application and the type of threats you need to be sort of aware of. Now, in this situation, if my DBA post me deploying this data level uh, client-side encryption, the DBA can no longer see the data. So check the box there. From a supply chain risk, if I'm using, again, a smaller cloud provider or maybe I'm using AWS, if they had an incident in their environment, well, I have strong assurances that my data is protected because they don't have the data key, nor do they have access to the key management system. All they have is the data that's protected because it's now ciphertext. And unless there's some magical way to break the encryption, which there may be a few years, but there isn't today for most well-vetted encryption algorithms, the data is protected. And then lastly, from a targeted attack point of view, let's say um, one of my admins clicked on a spear phishing link, downloaded malware, got their credentials compromised. Even with those credentials, they won't be able to get to the data. Is it impossible to get to the data? Is it impossible to ultimately get to the real valuable sensitive information? Of course not. But the idea is to make it much, much more difficult than the cloud providers offer you today. So you're one step closer to a safer environment. Now, what essentially I'm describing is making this shift, um, an approach that will help you transition from the generic uh, security theater-based controls to a fundamentally more secure approach. And what it ultimately does is it materially improves most common threat models and mitigates the risk that an adversary can carry out a successful attack. I'm going to bring this to life in a few minutes because I'm going to actually touch on a really cool case study that is publicly available as well, and I'll have it linked to uh, the team at Cash App which wanted to solve this problem for a number of reasons that they didn't get into much detail on, but I think their, their approach really resonates with the, the concept I'm talking about. So before I get into that, let's talk about what this approach accomplishes. Number one, it bifurcates data protection from storage. Like, there's a difference between data custodian and data admin, and we want to separate that. The DBA should not be able to see sensitive data. What they should be able to do is be able to do their job, which is running the database and making sure it's available. The second thing, is eliminating the admin's ability to view data. And I talked about this extensively, so I won't get into more detail here. Next is it individually protects each data element. Going back to the database example, most database encryption is encrypting an entire database or encrypting a database table. Um, and that's OK, but it's not nearly as valuable as being able to encrypt each individual data element. Now, this is beneficial, one, from a security point of view. But also, a lot of use cases exist now where data is commingled. Like you think about multi-tenant environments. Um, I'm going to pick on Snowflake, for example, because it's super popular. It's, it's a super awesome tool. But it's also really expensive. So people don't want to be running 100 instances of Snowflake. They want to run one or two. Um, and they want to put all their sensitive customer data, let's say they're a vendor or a SaaS provider, they want to put all the sensitive customer data in one Snowflake uh, it, table. But a lot of their customers push back and say, hey, I'm special. Don't commingle my data with other customers. And one of the ways that you can sort of provide those customers more assurance and, and sort of protective measures is by saying, hey, I'm commingling your data, but you as a customer have unique encryption keys for your data. And in, in many cases, if, if that's the world that you live in, that'll appease most customers, right? And if you can provide that cryptographic sort of assurance. The next thing is it protects structured and unstructured data. Um, when you think about most off-the-shelf encryption tooling, if you want to protect files like PDFs and PowerPoints and images, there's a whole bunch of tooling for that. That's called unstructured data encryption. And then if you want to protect data that's in a database that has you know, some structure to it, like a social security number, right? You're expecting only digits. Um, or a name where you're expecting, I think, only letters. Or a mainframe where it's got very strict requirements on like it can only be nine characters long and it must be alphanumeric. Um, that's, that's referred to structured data. That's generally a different set of tooling. Uh, and what application layer approaches or data level encryption enables you to do is to have one solution that applies to both data types. Next thing I want to touch on is um, obviously you get super critical key management capabilities. Again, um, 
most crypto failures, sorry, cryptography failures, I have to be careful with the word crypto because it means something else nowadays. Most cryptographic failures are because of key management. There's actually a really cool OWASP cheat sheet as well, if you're not familiar with it, that sort of walks through key management best practices. But it provides, this approach provides that critical key management capability. Um, the other thing is it requires the attacker to compromise many, many layers. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that specifically when I get to the Cash App case study. But it's not just getting to the S3 bucket or getting to the database. It's getting to the S3 bucket, it's getting to the database, it's getting to the data key, it's getting the authorization to actually access the service that's gonna decrypt the data key for you. And then lastly, uh, for many of us, because we live in this sort of, this world of development and security, is you're enabling your engineering teams to build encryption into their existing practices, whether it's a DevOps practice or process or what's a more traditional software development practice. And the previous uh, speaker touched on this, right? Like how do you build secure by design? How do you make that a sort of a standard blueprint? And this enables you to do that, enables you to codify data protection into your engineering practices. Now let's get into the super interesting stuff, which is what the Square Cash App team did. Um, so the problem that they were trying to solve is that they wanted to encrypt data as close to creation or use as possible to minimize window of exposure and reduce data breaches. So this is very similar to what I talked about earlier in my talk, right? Like, how do you move encryption closer and closer to where data is created? Um, so when first thinking through options, they considered using uh, an, an encryption technique which is called envelope encryption, uh, which essentially, to sort of cut a lot of detail out, is sending the data that you want to encrypt to KMS to be encrypted. However, they decided against that path for a few reasons. First, they didn't want the additional latency and availability risk of a round trip to KMS for every data encrypt or decrypt. They also wanted to be able to replicate encrypted data to other regions. As you remember from a few slides back, you can't do that with KMS uh, in many cases. Finally, they also wanted to reduce costs, which would allow them to apply encryption at a more fine-grained level. Uh, in order to do this, they actually ended up saying, you know what, we're not gonna use envelope encryption with KMS, which is essentially just sending the data to KMS to encrypt. What we wanna do um, is they want to build a scheme where individual services are assigned a dedicated KMS scheme. Now, I'm gonna walk you through this level of detail in a second, but I wanna to touch on three important components that they used. Remember I talked about the cryptographic library? They chose Google Tink. Um, in terms of their key management layer, they chose AWS KMS. Now, they have another system called Square Mason, which is an authorization layer, a service layer, that they also integrated to make sure that the right authorization controls were in place. Um, there's a blog post that's pretty extensive that covers a lot of what I'm gonna cover here. Uh, it's gonna be linked in my presentation. Definitely check it out if you want more detail, but I'm gonna walk you through at a high level uh, sort of their approach. So first, in their scheme, Individual services are assigned a dedicated KMS key. That KMS key is used to then envelope encrypt the service keys that are managed within the service itself. And again, that service is delivered through what's referred to as Square Mason on the slide. Their application layer, again, uses Google's Tink. It's an open source crypto, cryptographic library. Then these service key files are stored as serialized Tink key sets. I won't get into the detail of what that is, um, but I'm happy to talk about that after the talk because that's a 20 minute talk in itself. Those service keys are then read anytime the service startups, starts up, and only decrypted in memory. So it's never decrypted on disk. They are then using envelope encryption to encrypt and decrypt sensitive data in the services data store on demand. Um, and back uh, at AWS reInvent 2019, the, some of the Cash App folks described their cl cloud platform, which included this, this cloud resource provisioning service that on here it's called Square Mason. In this scenario, what they use Square Mason for um, is to create both the KMS and service keys for their services. What that then does is it sends, anytime someone wants to access sensitive data, they send a request to the Square Mason service to provision a new KMS key for the service and create the appropriate IAM policies and KMS key policies. So the IAM is actually managed through Square Mason instead of relying on what most people do, which is rely on KMS. 
So once that occurs, a request is then sent to Square Mason to generate TINK encryption keys for the specified type. And then that's further envelope encrypted. So to sort of summarize, there's three major pieces to what they're doing. Envelope encryption is achieved through AWS KMS. That's what's envelope encrypting the data keys. The Square Mason integration is allowing them to create service keys that are sort of generated and taken or destroyed in, in near real time. And then encryption and key protection is achieved via the, the envelope encryption and decryption of sensitive data in the service's data store. In terms of defenses, what does that actually get them? Um, one, this, the, the sort of architecture is designed to broadly mitigate the most common threats to cloud-based services, which are decrypting sensitive data requires access to three sources. One, the data store. Two, the encrypted service key files. And three, the services KMS key. KMS key stored in, inside the KMS, which is going to be very difficult to get into. Um, the data source itself, probably the easiest part to get to. And then the data um, service, very difficult to get to. And the most common vulnerabilities in cloud services only provide access to, at most, one of these at a time. So you've tremendously, they've tremendously improved their threat model here. So in order for an attacker to compromise encrypted sensitive data, they must successfully export the vulnerability and either trick the service into decrypting the wrong data and returning to the attacker, or cause the service to execute the attacker's code or shell commands. The second is unauthorized access to the service's data store. One of the most common vulnerabilities in the use of cloud infrastructure is that you inadvertently expose data. Like, this never happened, right? No one's inadvertently ever exposed their S3 bucket. But in this scenario, if this were to happen to one of their services, because they've used app layer encryption, the attacker would get access to ciphertext, would get access to actual data. And then lastly, the last one I'll touch on is unauthorized access to their service's IAM role. So one of the most damaging vulnerabilities in the use of most cloud infrastructure is leaked IAM credentials. So for example, you have a server-side request forgery attack on an EC2 instance, um, say an IMDMS v1 metadata endpoint gives you or an attacker access to cloud resources as a remote service. This would give the attacker access to both the services data stores as well as the keys in KMS. However, in their application layer encryption design, this access would not be sufficient to encrypt the sensitive data because the encrypted service keys are not available through the AWS APIs. Remember, they're completely separated. So unauthorized access is substantially more difficult. Um, there's a bunch of challenges that they ran into that they get into a lot more detail in their blog. So if you're interested in understanding those, um, definitely check it out. One is supporting service key rotation. They couldn't, by default, use multi-region AWS KMS because of the, some of the drawbacks and challenges here. Um, the second is regional specific specificities in AWS KMS. Uh, it just requires a lot of design considerations that they just were not willing to, to, to sort of undertake. And even if you do, once you make that design decision, there's a lot of ongoing things you have to consider. And then lastly, um, they believe that by creating a pattern that development teams can use moving forward, they introduced a bunch of agility in the team because now what you're avoiding is every time an engineer having to tackle this problem, trying to resolve the same issue over and over again. Now they have a pattern and service that the teams can use on a wide scale. Um, that's the rest of my talk. Well, I'm done. So if anyone knows where there's pizza, please let me know. Um, but in all seriousness, um, if there's questions, I know we don't have too much time. I'm happy to address any questions now. I'm also happy to hang around for a few minutes afterwards. Yes? So the question was, if you have sort of like browser level encryption, the browser or the user at the end would have, we need to have access to the key. It's a, great, it's a great question, a great point. So in most design models, what I've seen is not browser level integrations, mainly because of the complexities with different types of browsers. So what they'll end up doing in is they'll, they'll end up encrypting at the service layer. So they'll rely on from the browser to the, say, the back end, you use SSL because the, the likelihood of you getting compromised at the browser layer is lesser. Um, and if it were to occur, it's impacting sort of one user, one session, not thousands of users or thousands of sessions. But your point is absolutely, absolutely correct. There's ways of protecting that key at that layer. 
that I am happy to get into, but that'll probably be another 10 or 12 minute conversation. But great question. Yes. So just to restate the question, um, application encryption approaches are typically best suited for applications that are storing data versus ones that are actively, was it processing data? Processing data. Uh, good question. Uh, in my experience, I've seen them used in both. Um, so the sort of set, store, and forget, typically I've seen like ETL apps where data is getting moved or backup processes or scripts where you're encrypting a piece of data and you're likely never going to access it. But I've seen a lot of deployments, and I think the Cash App is a great example where people are using Cash App on a routine basis. Uh, a lot of FinTech applications that I've seen deploy this type of approach where the user is initially writing data because they created an account, they you know, share a sense of data, say it's Robinhood. Um, I don't know if Robinhood uses this approach, just they're the first company that came to mind. But let's say you're using that uh, application, and then you open up your app and you want to access some sensitive data. Um, so I've seen it used in both, actually. Yes? Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good point. So the, the sort of the question or the statement was around the complexities with multi-region, especially in the federal space, where there's a lot of concern that if an area, a zone, a region is down or not available, what happens? I think sort of the, the, the federal use cases are a little bit more, I want to say complicated, but have different considerations and requirements. Um, and I've seen them deploy these types of things in a more on-premise fashion where they're deploying their own KMS systems backed by HSMs uh, and introducing software layers that don't rely on any third party or cloud-based system. Uh, yes, one more question. Good question. So the question is the use case comes up where you've got, now you've got data encrypted in the database. The DBA can't get to it. I mean, they can get to the data, but they're going to see ciphertext. Let's say there's a research team. Um, let's say there's a data science team that's wanting to access this data. Uh, the DBA will not be able to grant them that access. So whomever is managing the application layer infrastructure can actually grant them access. Um, what I've most commonly seen is a service layer authorization, similar to what the Cash App team did. And you can grant generally via an existing permissions infrastructure, whether they're leveraging something like ADFS or Okta, generally done via API keys. So what you could do, you could say is, I have this encrypted Snowflake instance now that's being encrypted using this data or this approach, and I want this data science team to only have access to mobility data. Maybe it's a large telecommunications company and they want to know where their subscribers are using their services. You could definitely do that. And you can get down to even like fields columns, rows, tables, but fantastic question. Yes? Great question. So the question was, it seems based on my talk that server-side encryption is super easy to bypass. Um, what happens if they're trying to get into a system where you have application encryption? Um, the, Sort of the short answer is it's substantially more difficult for the attacker to carry out their attack. Um, in, in a very simplified example, in, once you've implemented a solution like this, not only does the attacker need to get to the data, they need to be able to have the mechanism by which decrypt 
the data key that's used to encrypt the data. That key is a master key which is stored inside of a, an HSM that the attacker would also need to compromise. So the attacker needs to compromise the data store, then they need to compromise the KMS layer, which is generally separated, and then thirdly, they need to compromise whatever the authorization layer that you might be using. So there's three different pieces now. And in most cases, the attacker is not going to know what master key was used to encrypt the piece of data. Sorry guys, I need to wrap. Um, if there are any other questions, I'm gonna hang on the corner, but thank you so much for the time and for hearing me out. Hope you enjoyed the talk. <laughs>